The stream's about to go live. Where are you two going? Hello everyone, welcome back to Totally Tanked. This is episode 38. We're going to do the Vickers Light Tanks of the interwar period. My name is John, I'm joined by Rob. Hello everybody, I'm Rob. Very importantly for posterity, it is the 8th of October 2022, so everything we say is completely true and accurate at this time, but could become totally wrong later. For those who don't know us, we are Totally Tanked. Oh yes, we are a tank podcast called Totally Tanked. That's us. Um, yes, and I'm not wearing my goggles, Rob. I've, I've stuffed up. There they are. There they are. There we All are. Right. All right, hang on. Um, Brand new from the interwebs. Ooh, look, <laughs> look at that. This is uh, something you might see later on in uh, part of uh, one of the videos, uh, one of the interviews we do, and inspired us to uh, grab some of them, inspired me to grab some of these because I really like the look of them. And uh, there'll be even a story about the little old cap here as well, some stage. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we're talking. Um, what have we got this week, uh, this month, John? The Vickers Interwar Light Tanks. Now, it's not just one, uh, it's not just two, it's, it's many. actually many, but mm. yeah, we're focusing... For those on the video feed, they're shining behind us. But they're most, uh, mostly we're going to be focusing on the uh, Vickers Mark VI and the six ton, uh, the Vickers six ton. Two separate uh, tanks made in two separate times, um, similar concepts, ideas, and uh, one had, one had a... And very interesting influence upon the world of tanks as we had it as we knew it you know, between the 20s and 30s and uh, up to the 40s. So we'll get into them. Should we do a little bit of housekeeping first? Yes, housekeeping. Yes. Um, so this is the moment where we um, thank the patrons. We have patrons. It's lovely to we have do, you We folks. do have patrons. And they, they're the ones who got to, uh, one of our first patrons got to select uh, what tank we're doing this this month and they chose the British Interwar uh, Light Tanks. Mm-hmm. There we go. Uh, look, look, their names are coming across the screen now. So, um, patreon.com, search for Totally Tanks. If you want to make a small, um, so it ranges from $3 to $10 uh, monthly payments to help pay for the sundries and ongoings of doing this um, production. Uh, it's very much appreciated and you get to have a say in things like um, what tanks we're going to talk about and um, things like that. Look look at that magnificent uh, feed there Rob. It's uh, beautiful. Um, okay. Or you could buy a lovely t-shirt. T-shirt. Like has done yes. it. Now uh, I, my t-shirt is not a totally tank t-shirt no. this week but uh, for those of you who do know it, love to hear from you. Mm. Alright. Uh, well, it's maybe from some other uh, futuristic... Red uh, Dwarf Massive. Yeah. <laughs> Boys from the Dwarf. Anyway, um, which tank we want to start off with? Let's do the Vickers 6 Ton. The Vickers 6 Ton. Now, this was a very interesting... Um, it, who, who, didn't, who built it and who didn't use it, John? British built it, sold it everywhere, didn't use it. And um, I think at this point, I want to... No, we won't talk about that yet. Sorry. So, Sorry. designed by uh, John Carden and Vivian Lloyd in 1928. Mm -hmm. um, and by, for the Vickers Company, they produced four for the British Army. And the British Army said, yeah, we're a bit tight on cash right now. So, we're uh, not going to go for that. And this is 1928, remember. So, this is only... They, they'd started into uh, the interwar period and they're saying and they're going the league of nations is going through the period of saying well we're going to outlaw war that the end uh, the first world war was the uh, the war to end all wars there will be no more war after this and we only need uh, light tanks in order to carry out um policing activities especially in those damn colonies mm. um Okay, all right, you brought it up, so let's, let's talk about it. The, um, <laughs> the international disarmament movement is largely forgotten and disgraced now because a certain Hitler, A, um, showed that they were wrong um, and foolish, and it sort of morphed into the nuclear disarmament movement um, and has been in that part of left-wing politics um, forever. But in the interwar period, you know, everyone got out of World War I saying that was horrible. They were, you know, literally carving into stone the war to end all wars. And people saying, how do we make sure it actually is the war to end all wars? In the actual text of the Treaty of Versailles, which formally ended World War I, there was a commitment that they were disarming Germany first, but it was very clear that the plan was from there to move to global disarmament so that a war like World War I couldn't happen again. And obviously, um, 
there were a lot of machinations and people in government weren't entirely signed on to um, making themselves completely vulnerable to future threats, um, with some good reasons. Uh, but it's a, it's a real lost moment in history because if it had succeeded, then, you know, World War II wouldn't have happened and, um, you know, tens of millions of lives wouldn't have been lost as well as, you know, the disruption and disaster and, and pain and suffering and grief and loss and, and all those things that still haunt our present day com coming out of that conflict and, and, and later conflicts. So it's a shame the disarmament movement failed. It's not necessarily its fault. Um, it's also worth noting, though, that government decisions, um, if you read, particularly there's a book called British Naval Procurement 1921 to 1938, which sounds very dry, but gives a real sense of, particularly with the Vickers Company, a lot of stuff that was going on using the cabinet records. And also Corelli Barnett's book, The Collapse of British Power, I would highly recommend for dealing with um, interwar um, imperial policy. Oh, I read and that one back in 94. I think yeah, right. Okay. Uh, and and defence policy. Um, and again, very much relying on, on the cabinet papers. So every time someone was coming to the British government, in particularly the 20s um, and the early 30s, saying, hey, we want to spend lots of money on more battleships or aircraft carriers or, um, or, or more tanks, they were having to explain why money should be spent on this. Now, the early 20s, they were willing to spend the money on these things and actually do some of the research and build the, uh, some tank doctrine and um, development plans. Mm. But by 28, 29, there's... Um, there was a little thing called the Great Depression around well. No, well. no, it was actually the 28, uh, they, they were all for it. And by 29, they said, yeah, no. Nah. We're going to uh, skip that one, and uh, we're going to cut everything back. So that that was was the Great Depression. I, I can't remember if the Great Depression had happened by the time they made those decisions, but there was uh, there was a turning point uh, in in those those years. It was, but but any major defence procurement was coming up against opposition um, in cabinet in parliament from the politicians saying, "Hang on." Why are we spending money on weapons when we're supposed to be moving towards not having weapons at all? Uh, and it reminds me quite a lot of the way at the moment we've got all these treaties about dealing with climate change, but whenever someone says, okay, well, if we're going to be climate neutral by 2050, we're going to have to um, get rid of all the petrol cars today, or at least start getting rid of them, and everyone goes, whoa, 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 what are you talking about, crazy? Um, so the same sort of dissonance between um, what people want to achieve and the things they commit to in treaties is happening with the things you actually have to do to get to the place you think you're going to. Uh, and frankly, the, the same sorts of people are involved on both sides of it, which is a little distressing because, you know, failure on climate change is not going to be good for anyone. Um, but bring us back to the Vickers Six Tonne. Yes, I was going to bring us to Vickers immediately on this point. If really? You give me a second. All right. Yeah. Okay, the big thing with Vickers was the Vickers had some capabilities, and Vickers was a huge industrial conglomerate. Uh, and uh, it lives on sort of as a bit of Rolls-Royce and a bit of BAE. Um, but uh, at the time, it was this huge industrial conglomerate and pretty much had the only steelworks in the British Empire that could make um, armour plate for heavy vehicles. And I'm talking battleships and um, the British armoured aircraft carriers. But they didn't have any need for that capability in the 20s, and it was this question of how do we keep Vickers alive and as a going concern and retaining their capabilities without actually spending lots of money. And they had to make a lot of really hard decisions um, as to how to... And because Vickers was a private company, it's, you know, the shareholders were um, reaping the returns of any government assistance mm. it was getting. Um, and and you know, at a time when you know, people were going hungry, um, that's a hard thing to justify. But if they hadn't kept Vickers going, then you could make a very good argument that World War II would have ended in British surrender in 1940. So... Um, the the folks who circumvented all the treaties to try and um, keep Vickers in business were vindicated by history, but they really could have been villains if things had gone a different way. There you go. But the Vickers Corporation has designed a tank in the 1920s. The British government doesn't want it for various reasons. Um, but the rest of the world is saying, um, we think we might want to get into this tank thing. Yep. Uh, so, they, so, they only made 150 of these tanks, but... They were all sold to overseas countries, except for four that uh, the British Army had evaluated, looked at, said, yeah, no. Nah. Um, so production started in 28 and went through till 1933. Um, uh, they, as I said, they only made 158. The s came in two varieties. Now, 
hopefully you'll have uh, there we go there's the uh, photos the two varieties of those are the t26 models but they are based upon um, so we'll get into the so we're not actually going to cover the t26 which the soviets made based upon the vickers 16. we'll cover it briefly and tangentially yeah. but it's going to be an episode of its own yeah, there are thousands because, of them. yeah there were 12,000 of these made of those the t26 made by uh the russians prior to oh, the soviets um, prior to world war ii uh, but the Vickers 6 ton, the actual original version, uh, it had two variations, uh, the A and B. Uh, one had the twin cupola, sorry, twin turrets with machine guns. The other had the... Uh, with and I've got to say, they're the stupidest looking things. They really are. But as you can see from the photos, they you, you would think, why would anybody come up with the idea of uh, this, this sort of uh, turret configuration? And then you had the... Um, the version with the three pounder, uh, three pounder gun in it, which was the uh, and and a Vickers machine gun. Um, it had 19 to 25 mils of armor all scattered around it, uh, 25 on the, uh, the front of the turret. Um, crew was three in the gun version with the single turret, or four in the um, machine gun version with the twin turrets. You could do 35 k's an hour. Um, cross country and on road, which was pretty fast. Yeah, it was. It was decent. It was decent. Uh, it could do 160 k's and um, 7.3 tons worth of uh, of tank in there. Um, it was a little uh, tank, but it got sold to. <laughs> it got sold to, and it went, and not just sold, but also then captured and uh, used by various countries over the time. So, the Soviets bought 15 in 1930. One, I want to say. Um, so this is long before. So they finished their revolution. Uh, Stalin had taken power by this stage, and they were after some sort of tank. And uh, one of the situations with the various League of Nations treaties is that you weren't allowed to build heavier tanks, and so you were allowed to have light tanks because that could be used for police actions. Uh, against any upstart colonials that might. Well, be I mean, out. you even look in um, a lot of police forces around the world mm. today operate um, smallly armored vehicles, mm. um, you know, for dealing with people they displease of. Yeah. <laughs> so the Soviets bought fifteen and plus a license to build their own, and that's where they then turned it into the T twenty six. As we said, made, they made twelve thousand, so that's a significant number. Uh, Poland bought th bought fifty of those. They put together and in in, they constructed 38 of those to put them together uh, and then they used the other 12 for spare parts. Portugal bought two for evaluation purposes. Greece bought four for evaluation purposes. Bulgaria bought eight. Bolivia bought three. And now we'll get into what uh, what happened with the, those Bolivian threes, uh, three tanks at some stage. China, and I, when I say China, I'm talking the nationalist Chinese bought uh, 20. Uh, Siam, which saw quite a lot of action against the Japanese. Yep. Um, they weren't messing around with those. Yep. Siam or Thailand, as we call it these days, bought thirty. Canada had twelve. Finland had twenty-six, uh, and they bought an, and they had another eight delivered. Um, the Finns had all theirs, none with their, none with their weapons installed. They said, you know what, we'll take the tanks, we'll leave the guns out because we think they're rubbish, and we'll put our own guns in there, thanks yeah, much. Yeah, the 37mm Bofors anti-tank gun was a much better weapon than that. certainly was. Yeah. Uh, Japan bought one for evaluation, and... Boy, did that turn up in the Hargo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in 1930, they, they bought theirs, uh, they got theirs for evaluation, and uh, they really said, okay, this is the design we're looking at, and from that they then designed the Hargo. Um, Turkey had listed as having 16, but I'm not sure if they, were, if they were bought or in... So they got 16 in 1940. Now, I'm not sure if those were purchased at some stage or they were gifted as captured um, uh, six-tonners or somebody's misidentified the six-tonners as um, T20, T26s and they were given those from captured stocks from the, uh, from the Germans. Um, the UK, had, as I said before, had four for training and evaluation purposes. Romania... List is having 19. Again, I think those were captured from the Soviets and they were probably T26s rather than uh, the proper Vickers 6 tons. Um, but significantly, uh, unlike the uh, Mark 6, uh, there is no depiction of the Vickers 6 ton in Girls und Panzer, uh, unlike the uh, T26, of which there is. 
Okay, well, that's that's the most important fact uh, we can uh, impart. Now, I'll just throw in the Spanish uh, Republicans had one that was captured by, given to them, sold to them by Paraguay, who they... Who Bolivia, had I believe. No, by Paraguay. Oh, okay, yep. Who had captured it off the Bolivians when we'll get to the mm. uh, the Grand Chaco War. Yeah, and although the Spanish Republic did also get a number of um, T-26s, T-26s from, from the, the Soviets. Soviets. Yes. And it is worth noting with the Soviets, and I'm, you'd love to be a fly on the wall when they negotiated this, Soviets did buy a license from um, Vickers to produce mm. the T-26 uh, based on the, um, the six ton. And um, that... It's quite something when you think about it that at this point, you know, communism was the um, the big bad, the enemy. Um, everyone thought that was going to be the next thing that we were fighting. Fascism wasn't at that stage viewed as the um, the, no, the, fascists the, the, the trains were on time. Everybody was for them. Well, but they t- brought order and re- stability to Europe. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in terms little of, did they know <laughs> the end of the disarmament movement was pretty much when um, Hitler withdrew Germany from the um, disarmament conference. And that was 1934. Mm. Um, so yeah, so this is before all that. So yeah, yeah it is significant. There are significant times um, within the production of the six ton. I was saying, yep, it happened before a lot of things went. Uh, uh, everybody started seeing the writing on the wall. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it was. It wasn't a useful combat vehicle in in many ways. And look, the the, the twin turrets. It's just you just look at those and you just go. And I, I had a good look at them. Uh, so the um, T-26s they have at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum that uh, I've t- taken the photos of and uh, we got up there behind us. Um, I had a good look at them and the, the distance between those two turrets is not a lot and they can only fire 120 degrees to left and right from uh, their, their forward. So you, you can't bring both guns to bear on the same target unless it's right in front of you. There was that cult of the machine gun era when people viewed the main purpose of a tank being to act as a mobile mm. um, pillbox for um, spraying machine gun fire. And as we've discussed in other episodes, it came along in people's minds somewhat later that actually firing a high explosive shell was um, a better way of... Um, being anti-personnel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing, that, one of the reasons why they did do it though, is they found that twin turrets you actually get a higher rate of fire than if you had two uh, two machine guns within the same turret, uh, and you could actually engage uh, targets more for a machine gun. You could actually engage targets more effectively because you had a wider range of fire. So whereas a lot of tankets that were being deployed at that stage had um, with uh, as machine gun carriers. Could only fire forwards, and so it didn't even it weren't even mounted in a um, uh, any sort of mount that could allow them to slew left and right, unless without moving the actual tank it themselves. So this is the uh, Italian CV thirty three or thirty or whatever they are, now, and uh, other sort of and the Carden Lloyd carriers. A very exciting thing that came out of the six ton though was technically it's called the turret platform, and when we discussed the Italian tank, um, I described it as the wedding cake design. Uh, where rising above the um, the tracks, you've got this um, little square platform that the turret then gets plonked on. And once you see it here in the Vickers 6 ton, and you, um, those watching on the video will see it happening behind us, uh, you then look at the Italian tank, um, you definitely look at the T-26s, but there's a whole generation of tanks that retained this feature to create a little more um, volume inside the tank uh, and to give the turret a bit more elevation before tank designers realised down the road that this was just a really stupid, terrible idea um, and what you did not want to increase the height of the vehicle unnecessarily. No, not unless you had a specific reason for uh, mm. raising it up. But it does... Let's lean into the idea of uh, the design of the tank. Now, remember, the main tanks that we'd seen during World War uh, One was the um, was Mephisto, the... Uh, A7V? Yep, AF, uh, AF7V yeah. and um, the Mark 4 and 5 uh, British tanks. Great big lumbering things. Now, the Renault uh, FT had mm. come out... Do you know what the F in FT stands for? Tell me. French. Good on them, French tank. Yeah. <laughs> Renault French tank. <laughs> when, the, when the Americans bought um, a great number of them and equipped their troops for use in... Um, late 17 to 18, um, they distinguished it as, um, yeah, Renault FT for French tank. There you go, mm. because there were so many other tanks too. Oh, this is unlike the Americans who can just name everything M. Or uh, gun motor carriage. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's an M in that. Uh, but anyway, so the 
the only other tank there out of, in, in significant numbers at this time was the uh, Renault FT, and so which has a similar design. Of it's got uh, external tracks, it's got a driver and a forward and a um, uh, well, I think it had the I can't remember if it has a two or no, we haven't done the Renault FT yet, so no. I can't remember if it has a one or two person turret. But anyway, I it has a turret with a gun. It's just a one person turret. It has a gun, yeah. turret with a gun, and that being the idea of that is what becomes the modern tank now. The Vickers 6 ton uh, reinforces that idea of saying this is what a tank looks like. And in 1928, people still weren't sure what a tank was going to look like in the future. And that's well, they weren't sure what they were going to use them for either. Mm. And I mean, frankly, um, we still haven't resolved that debate. Um, yeah, and and there was this interesting thing, of course, where the um, the cavalry did not want these smelly vehicles they wanted their horses mm. um and eventually they would come kicking and screaming when they realized it was either accept vehicles or um be um you know ushered off the battlefield completely so suddenly cavalry use of tanks comes back as a scouting and screening um vehicle um and they get rolled into the uh, uh in with the royal Art uh, armored corps yeah, uh, but then there's, you know, is it a Royal battle... Tank regiment, actually. Royal Tank Regiment, yeah. but, you know, is it a battlefield assault gun, um, or um, is it an infantry support vehicle? Is um, it manned by artillery? Is it manned by yeah. uh, cavalry? Is it uh, dedicated uh, tankers? Hmm. Or, you know, or is it organic to the um, infantry division, which is not a bad place to have it for a number of uses? At, as, uh, long as, you're, uh, as long as you're not curtailing its use as to what a tank should be doing, rather than just supporting infantry. You don't want it... If you if you've got a tank, you don't want it just supporting infantry. You want infantry supporting it. Yeah. So it's carrying it out its activities. But we are we are talking about an era where engines did not have enough power for all the things they wanted the tank to do, mm -hmm. and it it wouldn't really be until 1943 that you know with uh, Meteor that suddenly there was. Hmm. Um, Even at the beginning of the war, yeah. the the Brits uh, still didn't have an engine that they could actually use effectively. That's why they yeah. were bringing in the American Liberty engines to yeah. uh, to install in their tanks, but. Um, yeah, you're right. It was the the media's is coming along later. But anyway, so as I was saying, so it the Vickers six ton becomes the model for those early interwar year tanks, along with the Renault FT. The, uh, it had better maneuverability, speed, and armor than the uh, Renault, and um, it was still a low cost, and so that's why people were willing to buy it from Vickers, even though the British um, uh, Army were not. Um, and so it from there. It got used around the world, uh, as mainly, as we're saying, the Soviets with their license to build the T-26s from that. But we'll get into uh, some of the um, some of the activities that it was used for in that, especially mm. in that interwar period. I think it's worth just noting that it was very much the template for pretty much every country that started using tanks. For well, we, we while we figure out these vehicles, we'll get some of these and um, trundle them around. Um, they were of no real use or value in the Second World War, but the experience they um, gave and the um, allowing for the creation of um, cores and training cadres and, and maintenance and, and all the things that peak countries had to figure out to use them, the uh, the Vickers 6 ton was incredibly... Um, and then maintaining the industry to actually be able to build tanks. Yeah. Well, you, you look at French tank design just immediately before World War II when they're having to go with what they know are inferior designs because mm. French industry... French industry, one of the um, leading powers of the world, wasn't up to making things they needed. Yeah, well, same with yeah. the British, but we'll get to yeah. that with the uh, uh, the Mark Sixes. Mm. All right, so uh, the six ton conflicts. Should we go into what they yeah, actually used okay. for? Yeah, okay. Right. let's go with that. All right, so discounting actions whereby it was mainly the T26s, except for where the T26s were involved. Uh, the first main conflict, uh, to my knowledge, is was the Gran Chaco War between uh, Bolivia and Paraguay in from 1932 to 1935. Uh, now, it's always reported that uh, it was a big, well, it was a big fight for the potential of oil. Uh, so it was uh, basically, um, uh, the Gran Chaco was a, great big deserty type uh, horrible area to that nobody lives in uh, between the two countries uh, uh, but there was speculation that there were, was oil in there and both countries were saying well we need something to um, um, bring up uh, uh, get some money in the bank and thought look let's uh, the the standard oil in the Bolivian American side and there was sh Dutch shell uh, in the Paraguayan side still looking for oil in those areas, but hadn't actually found it by the start of the war, but they were both wanting to get in there. 
Um, it was the first use of tanks in the Americas uh, as a, in a combat situation in the Americas. So it, it was people say it was uh, in South America, but it was actually the first tank battle. Uh, the, um, first use of tanks in all of the Americas. Mm. Well, um, I mean, North American tank battles have been thin on the ground and um, long, long may it stay that way. Yes. <laughs> but the Hargo and the Sherman did fire that in that Aleutian Island. I can't remember the name of Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, covered it. <laughs> All right, so the as we said before, the uh, Bolivians had, uh, with their German advisors, had bought uh, three uh, Vickers six tons, and, but they didn't go well in the dust and the heat of the grass of the Chaco, um, and kept you know, and getting uh, either bogged, overheating, or breaking down. It's uh, a hard thing when you've only got three of anything, mm. uh, partly because they become the focus of the enemy attention and and don't get a chance to shine. Um, and just partly because, you know, one's always in the shop and um, the crew for the other one's on leave. They, and, had, they uh, had eight weeks of training by the time the, start, the war started. Not so, enough. No, no. So mm. having only just bought these things, uh, they've gone out... And, and also, what are the German advisors helping them with? They're like, hey, we don't know what to do with these things either. <laughs> well, they, was, yeah, they had maintainers as well there. So, sure. And they, yeah. were leading, they were basically leading the um, Bolivian army. At this I'm stage. Sh- uh, yeah, but my, my, my point was more that the Germans were not the um, experts in armour at this time that they would become. But they were learning a lot themselves. Yeah, that was the bigger thing. Germany was getting more out of that than the um, Bolivians, I yeah, reckon. And they um, and then they started buying some uh, Italian tankettes and other bits and pieces with flamethrowers and all sorts of fun things. Mm. However, um, getting back to the Vickers six tons, the Paraguay. So they did uh, see a lot of action. Uh, they did break down a lot. Uh, the the water and the water cooled Vickers kept on drying up, and lots of people died from dehydration and other horrible diseases because the uh, <clears throat> Bolivian soldiers were from high altitude and couldn't uh, didn't really like it down at uh, the hot, dry, con- uh, dry tropical conditions um, uh, on the ground, Chaco. Uh, however, the Paraguayans managed to capture two of these because six tons by uh, cavalry riding up on them, and uh, when they were isolated and away from their infantry, this will be a common theme with any yeah. sort of tan- tanks. <laughs> we heard that before. <laughs> tanks, uh, tanks isolated without infantry support uh, are easily um, uh, uh, taken care of. So. So the uh, Paraguayans have captured two of them. As we said before, uh, they've then gone, uh, sold one of them to the Spanish Republicans for the during the Spanish Civil War, and the other one they kept as a trophy uh, out in Asuncion, and Asuncion, however you want to pronounce it, um, mm-hmm. I'm sure assuming, assuming that is. Um, and they finally gave that trophy back to Bolivia in 1990, some 60, well, 55 years after. Um, so, again, they had a significant effect on the war, either being the focus of attacks or being able to break up the wooden pillboxes that were being used by both sides. And so, um, eventually, the Bolivians had to go out and buy a bunch of anti-tank rifles in order to take out their own tanks that had been taken by the Paraguayans. Um, so, it's just one of those things. It's a source of considerable embarrassment. Yeah, uh, yeah. Although, at least back in those days, an anti-tank rifle, you know, it's basically... A, what would today you'd think of as a 50 caliber hunting rifle um well yeah, yeah these were yeah 15 mil uh, um uh, anti-tank rifles okay, a bit, bit bigger than a 50 cal but, but not enormously bigger and uh, you know it's the, the training the logistics just mm. even shipping them you know a box will do yeah. uh isn't the hardest thing in the world as opposed to um trying to move um javelins or in-laws mm. around today yeah, yeah. Oh, and look the because it had the, the tanks themselves had the limited protection against small arms fire and even uh, or even sort of any sort of heavy machine gun fire um, and it was distinctly uh, morale um, depleting for the crew inside to be hit with hit hearing the tink 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 of small arms fire hitting the outside of your sh- well, your they had tank sp- spoiling, real spoiling hazards yeah, as well even from and, small arms yeah, <laughs> and even uh, splash from uh, shrapnel from uh, um, sh- uh, shredded bullets h- mm. hitting the edges of the welds uh, on the tank or the where that uh, the, the plates would be meet together and um, uh, hot lead basically coming in through those areas. So yeah, well, I was, mean, spl- splash was also because these things had a lot of vision slits, um, which you know when you're designing your first tank ever in your life seems like maybe a way to go. Um, but lead, when it hits hardened steel, just deforms around it and turns liquid and sprays um, mm. in the inside. It may or may not kill you, but it makes you really feel really miserable. Yeah, it doesn't. Make, it's not a good day. No, no. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, so that was 
the first little uh, it was proper war. It was it lasted three years and depleted those two countries quite considerably. Uh, the next uh, situation was uh, Finland, and uh, there thirty eight of um, thirty eight um, because Mark, sorry because six tons. Um, they only had third. So when the Winter War of thirty nine started and the Russians or the Soviets invaded, um, they only had thirteen of their thirty eight tanks available. Uh, and then they, um, uh, as the Russians came, uh, the Soviets came in, and they sent their T-26s uh, through to the Finnish lines, and the uh, without infantry support or the infantry who had been lost and left behind. And of course, the T-26s were breaking down during uh, through the, the the deep snow. Uh, once the um, they got isolated, the Finnish infantry were able to. Um, Take them, take them out, and then roll up the infantry that were following along behind with their machine guns. So the Russians had no uh, had had no fun, uh, as it were, of going into Finland with sending the tanks in first without infantry support. But when the Finns then tried it themselves with their Vickers uh, six tons, it had the same thing happened. They sent their tanks forward without infantry support. The Russians uh, rolled them up, and then uh, they basically had to sue for peace. So it was quite the slaughter, by the sound of it. It was. Uh, it was. Yeah. They lost. Um, they lost quite, uh, all but six of their uh, six tonners. Mm. Yeah. So again, quite a significant war for those uh, those two countries in that time, prior and um, before them both entering. Uh, well, sorry. The Soviets entering World War Two on uh, uh, against the Axis, and the Spins. yeah, I mean, you look at Finnish history; they have a very different view of World War Two. To yeah, it, was, yeah, it, it really was, and you can't really judge them for it because they were caught between nobody else was helping them. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's what uh, you go with where the help is, because unless you're willing to give up your own country. If you if you if you're looking for something to read, um, the Mannerheim letter, which uh, Mannerheim was the um, president, prime minister of Finland, um, to to Hitler in 1944, where he says we're um, leaving the Axis. Sorry about that. Um, in a weird way, it's it's quite touching because he basically says, "Look, we know we've been allies, um, but um, when this all goes horribly wrong, uh, Germany will survive. But I'm not sure about Finland, so we need to um, look oh, after ourselves." Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so that's why the uh, one of the T26s you see uh, in the slideshow behind us will have uh, Finnish swash. Uh, uh, no, German iron crosses are on that one, but um, no, they're actually Finnish markings, okay. They are Finnish markings, but mm. it's uh, their version of the uh, swastika, oh. uh, so that's why I thought that was a, a straight cross, though. Anyway, no, that's fine, but it's mm. uh, so, but those ones are the T26s that the Finns had captured from the Russians and were then using against the uh, against the Russians at that stage. Mm. Um, the next one was the the Siam uh, Franco War of October of uh, 1940. So, once uh, Vichy France had been established after the fall of France in June of 1940. Uh, Siam slash Thailand had said, right, uh, so these guys are pretty weak now and they, their government's just fallen. And so in uh, French Indochina, which is what we're looking at is um, um, Vietnam uh, combined and mm. uh, Laos and um, Cambodia. And the Kingdom of Siam, which was an independent kingdom, the only independent non colonialized uh, air, uh, country in that part of um, Southeast Asia had their own military with uh, over 100 tanks, uh, 30 of which were uh, Vickers 6 tons. Mm. Said They don't talk much about how alive they were with Japan in the war, the ties. But, uh, anyway. No, well, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> Japanese code prosperity for sphere. Yeah, look, I'm not saying the Getting... Thais had a lot of choices, but it is kind of when you read history of um, the Japanese invasion of Malaya, it's all um, oh, and then the Japanese suddenly invaded, and the fact that the Japanese have been able to invade through Thailand is something that really doesn't get talked about. Well, um, from anyway. the Thais' point of view, is I'm not the... saying the Thais owed us anything. <laughs> no, um, yeah. I, would, I mean having the colonial powers uh, take uh, regions the, of their country for the mm. for the sake of it, because they're saying well. We can, which mm. is what the French had done for uh, uh, to Thailand, and which is Thailand. This is why Thailand has, has said in um, uh, October of 1940, said, you know what, you guys are weak. Um, we want the provinces that you've taken uh, some years ago back, and we're going to uh, take you on and, uh, and take them. And so eventually they've uh, they've invaded. 
and they've had their uh, Vickers six tons running around and causing great havoc to the French colonial forces that were based in Indochina. Um, and they would have done, there was quite a large conflict there and the Vickers six tons would have done quite well at uh, having uh, one, one particular battle, battle having defeated the French forces. They were chasing them down and were going to uh, basically route, route them. Uh, however, the French Foreign Legion troops that were stationed with those um, colonial troops uh, brought in their artillery and used it in direct fire support role and were able to stop the uh, advance of the Vickers six tons and stop the basically the route of the army of uh, that stage. Yeah, field guns really are the natural solution to light tanks. Yes, and, but uh, yeah. again, used deployed employed by highly trained uh, yeah. forces is essentially where where it's coming to. And so yeah. the Japanese uh, stepped in to negotiate a ceasefire slash um, uh, armistice between the two sides and Thailand got um, back some of the uh, some of the territory that they had had to cede to the French previously uh, but not as much as they would have liked basically they would have liked to have kept on going but the Japanese basically had too big an influence in the situation and said no everybody's got to stop fighting and look we'll take over French Indochina right now as part of the uh, Axis Alliance with with Germany, and so that's why they were able to influence the situation so strongly in 1940. Mm. Um, then we've got uh, we've done the Finns, the Grand Chaco, the Vichy France, uh, Poland. Poland had their uh, Vickers six tons. They had um, again. They had. 38 of them, but they, sorry, they bought 50, but they only assembled 38 and used the other 12 for spare parts. Which is quite a sensible way to do it. Again, they they uh, had a number of innovations and upgrades to their tanks, uh, even so much so that they what, they went from 6 tons to 9 tons, mm. uh, with bigger guns, uh, better armour, um, uh, better carburetors, and better air intakes to stop overheating, better transmission, so they re-designated theirs as a 30, I can't remember the number, sorry, 3017, no. Um, My big problem with the idea that I oh, will just get some extra vehicles as spares is that there's things like the actual hull of the tank that almost never wears out, um, but then there's things like um, final drives and transmissions that um, wear out all the time. So it's not necessarily the best way to buy spare parts to buy complete tanks. They, they still have some roles for training. Mm. You can do some things, but yeah. But if Vickers isn't isn't building any, doesn't have a production run of these tanks anymore, then and they're saying to you, buy what you want now mm. because we are not going to provide uh, spares in the future. Then yeah. that's probably not a bad bad way of making sure that you've actually got. Yeah, I mean the, the Germans fell into the same trap where they did almost no spare parts production. They just shipped f completed tanks to get cannibalized, and mm. um, you know that. I'd, just think that's a, a poor approach. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the one thing with the uh, Polish uh, six tonners were, was that um, they had been trained with and used for quite some time from their purchase in 1936 um, and were able to, in fact, no, sorry, from 33. And so they were quite worn uh, and their tracks were quite worn. However, when the Germans invaded uh, and Russians invaded in '39, uh, they uh, did deploy them quite well. They were used effectively. However, they did not have the armor and capabilities to stand up to the um, uh, the Panzer IIs and the 38Ts that the uh, Germans were running around in. I was going to say a 20 millimeter auto cannon is a pretty terrifying thing for one of these vehicles. Yes, at the yes, end. it is. <laughs> doc, doc, doc. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So the Nazis captured a number of uh, uh, of the six tonners and converted them into self-propelled guns and so again uh, they kept on going around the war um, the Italians will throw in uh, the Italian side of the house mm -hmm. uh, they captured a number of T-26s during the Spanish Civil War they had their they weren't the Condor they were the uh, free Italian company or something like that to, mm. uh, they were fighting on the nationalist side on Franco's side um, they did capture a number of the uh, T-26s and brought them back to Italy and they used those as the basis for design for their M11 uh, 39s and their M13 40s so again uh, to the point as we discussed you've got this turret platform that actually has no good purpose being there but because the Italians were just copying the design yeah. over so it wasn't uh, the six tonner itself but mm. they also didn't capture the uh, Bolivian six tonner that the Spanish uh, Republicans had mm. um, <clears throat> so the six tonner was designed and built in 28 along with the uh, uh, and Along with the uh, FT, the Renault FT was one of the 
preeminent tanks of that interwar, interwar period. There were no other realistic tanks being built at that time from 28 until uh, even uh, later on. Later on. Um, well, it's the mid 30s you really get, get people getting started on. Yeah, uh, which, tank design. Where, which is where we get into the uh, biggest Mark Six. Yes. Um, however, it set the t stage for tanks in the interwar years and when war was going to be outlawed and finished. Mm. Um, uh, I know we'll come back and mention a few other things, but is there anything else you want to say about the 600? I think that's good, and my beer glass is empty, so I we're think we should do our first of two beer reviews. After we come back from this quick break. Oh. Hey there, folks. Thanks for your patience. Now... Uh, mm -hmm. You might have noticed the uh, change, change, his hat. change in the ensemble. So uh, I've gone for the uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas uh, look of uh, uh, with the tank hat. So oh, I just, my I just, God, what have you got us here? Well, off. Now, when I when I started reading about the uh, Vickers six ton, I said, "Well, this is a tank that the the British bought, but uh, we're not we're not using." Um, and I said, well, what's a beer that would go with that? And what's a beer that somebody produces, but they don't actually drink? And the first thought that came to my mind was... Fosters! Fosters. For yeah. those who don't know, Australians don't drink Fosters. Yeah, but we, British people drink Fosters, and they pretend they're drinking an Australian beer while they do it. Yes, um, they do not drink Fosters. So, uh, But John said, yeah, do we got it? So we came up with the idea of uh, a British India Pale Ale. Now, John, tell me why... A British India Pale Ale is equivalent to uh, building a tank but not actually using yourself and exporting it overseas. So, now it should be noted that modern IPAs have almost nothing in common with the historic um, India Pale Ales of the um, 19th century. But in the, the glory days of the Raj, a, um, a young British officer being sent out east um, was given a five ton shipping allowance. And, to India, uh, that is. Yeah, to India and back from India. Mm. Um, now, the average young officer did not own five tons of possessions. Some definitely did because they were very wealthy, but quite a lot of them didn't. And they were looking around saying, well, what are we going to do with this? And then a bunch of brewers came up to them and said, well, me lad, you've got nothing in the world um, except your commission um, and your five ton shipping allowance. How about you let us put four tons of beer in your shipping allowance? And the water over there is very bad to drink, so you want something you can take, you can drink, well, that you can drink. Yeah, yeah, your, your young officer um, wasn't didn't get to drink any of the beer once they'd given up that space in the shipping allowance. <laughs> um, but so they were shipping beer over to India in the young officer's um, shipping allowance, um, and then quite often um, the, they couldn't find sellers for it in the Indian market, um, so it ended up coming back. And what they discovered was that after an um, 18 month holiday to India and back in the hold of a ship, and in particular they put in um, more um, fermentables and extra hops to keep it from going off during this transit, and this was in wooden barrels, um, it was quite nice. Yeah. Having been through this process of being a stronger, hoppier beer um, that had had a um, long barrel aging process. So that's the. the where you know, India Pale Ale um, IPA comes from. A lot of b really big beer um, nerds these days are saying we should call them Ippers like they do in Central Europe rather than IPA because the the modern ones have really no shared heritage with those historic beers. Um, but there we go. It's also it's a beer made for export is why we thought it's, IPA was appropriate. Well, John thought it was appropriate. And so today we have a Fuller's uh, India Pale Ale. Yep. It is a, One of the great London breweries. It is a 5.3% alcohol. It's a 500ml uh, uh, bottle, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the... Uh, yep. Mm, and it's been bottle conditioned, they say. Mm. It just I mean, means they've left it in the bottle for a while. Um, <laughs> possibly it means they've had some secondary fermentation in the bottle to make it fizzy. Um, yes, it's fine. It's very much a British IPA. Um... Very fragrant on the nose. Very snazzy looking bottle. Yeah. Uh, nine bucks for one of these. Yeah, okay. So 500 mils. So it's not too bad for a 500 no. mil. No, not, not bad at all. Uh, and with that purple, you'll be... I was about to say. Matches your shirt. Ooh, very good point. Mm. It does match. There, there you go. It's, mm. uh, it's, uh, uh, there's a conversation to be you'll had You'll be there. a hit with the lesbians. <laughs> I already you am. You already are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, 
They have uh, a, uh, not a rampant, but a some sort of hippogriff on the front drinking a beer, or is it holding hops? And lots of uh, curly cues. Of, yeah. Uh, oh, coming off. Anyway, that's... it's to be honest. I'm a little down on the IPA style at the moment because all these breweries all over the world are just making a beer that tastes the same as all the others and um, I find that um, sad. They could, they could all be doing wildly different things but they don't want to because the market isn't there for wildly different things. Um, no? Hmm. But it's beer. It is beer. It's pretty good. I like it. All right, Rob. Um, hang on, so, hang on. I'm just yeah. going to talk about... Oh, you want to talk about your hat? My hat. Uh, uh, sorry. So, 11-year-old me... Mm-hmm. Went into the army disposal store somewhere in uh, Virginia, back way back when, and yeah. bought. Your dad was on a posting to the embassy, I believe. Uh, no, no, F 18s flight simulator. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. with uh, some sort of. Corporate. Okay, so but you, 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 you as a child were there in America because yeah. your dad was being posted yes, there with the yes. Air Force. Yeah. Well, no, no, he was a civilian by that stage. Mm. But uh, yes, so having bought this when I was eleven, I've still kept hold of it, and uh, when I used to run around, not the. Uh, not the backwoods of Virginia, but uh, essentially the suburban woods of Virginia, uh, all dressed up in cams and having a great old time and pretending to be uh, Red Dawn and so forth and having fun with that. But uh, So I found that in the cupboard the other day and I thought it'd go very well with the, the new split prism goggles that uh, we've got. Mm. So Only smells slightly of possum wee. Only smells slightly of possum wee. Mm. I did do a lot of uh, work to try and get the uh, the possum sm <laughs> wee smell out of it, but uh, it's still a little bit there. It's mm. okay. Yeah. I can put up with that because that's just the uh, smell of uh, mm. a lot of places and a lot of garages within a, within Canberra. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> when, the <laughs> when the lockdown started um, here in this house, we had a possum infestation that became came a lot more apparent when we were in the house 24-7 and uh, <laughs> it, it culminated with the possum bursting through one of the walls and the, the dogs really? going absolutely berserk yeah and, oh, uh, it's, oh. all, it's all been fixed now my, uh, my, my dogs love chasing the possums uh, mm. about 10 o'clock at night and just, uh, mm. especially as they're coming Actually, out it was, it was Roger the cat who was fiercest in repelling the invader uh, the, the, the dogs were following along behind I, I, could, uh, I, could, I could tell you stories about my dogs and uh, worrying about uh, water bottle squirting uh, possums but uh, mm. I, I won't for the moment Cool. Because we're going on to another tank. The, the next British um, light tank of the interwar period, um, simply known as the Vickers Light Marks 1 through 6. Yes. Um, now, there, were, there was 1 through 5, but um, they weren't terribly interesting, and except for their design features. They, they, and, and there's marks, a couple of design marks, features. Marks let, me, let, me, let me do this. There's a couple of design features that are interesting. One is all of the Vickers Lights through, 1 through 6 had parts commonality. So they very much were a continuum um, where they were making improvements and changing things, but the, the nuts and bolts um, and the, the fittings and the drill holes and the webbers and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't even know if they had webbers. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> before someone goes nuts. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, the point was they, they were actually very similar vehicles, but Mr. Carden and Mr. Lloyd, our friends from um, the uh, Vicar 6 ton, yep. Designed the um, Carden Lloyd Carrier, which would evolve into the Universal Carrier, sometimes known as the Brand Gun Carrier. They also evolved the Carden Lloyd Carrier into the Vickers Light Tanks, to the point that in the early marks of the Vickers Light Tank, the return rollers were on the uh, mounted to the bogies, so it was on the same mounting as the bottom wheels. Um, and this was something that you needed in the carriers because the way they ste the carriers steered was by pushing the bogey, the central bogey out and warping the whole track so the, um, the, the tank when would turn. When you're steering at speed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was how they steered and they carried that configuration over even though the Vickers light tanks didn't use the, um, the track warping to steer but the uh, return rollers stayed on the, um, mm. on the bogeys. Uh, so the, 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 the Carden Lord Carrier has some real continuity into the, um, the Vickers Light. Um, and that was only rem removed, I think, around the Mark III. It was, it was removed as they progressed. Um, and, that, and that's worth noting. Uh, but Carden Lloyd's design heritage through all these vehicles do carry through. Um, which is part of why we've lumped them all together for, mm. uh, for this episode. Um, but the... There, there is significant commonality between Mark 1 through 6, even though they, they look quite different, and at least they've gotten rid of the stupid wedding cake design yes. uh, by this point. <laughs> rest of the Italians were picking it up, saying, this is awesome, we can fit our stupid double machine guns in. But, uh, uh, the Breakers. Mm. All right, so we have the... Uh, I'm just going to be mainly talking about... Uh, I'll let you throw in anything about the 1 to 3. No, five. I mean, the 6 is the one that was built in serious numbers, yeah. 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 So, <clears throat> speaking of serious numbers, they built uh, 1,600 of them. Um, so... 
not as many uh, as the, the Russians would build the uh, T-26, but um, they were all built by the British, um, and they had... Uh, Oh, the, the production was from 1936 to 1940 uh, for the Mark 6s. The Mark uh, 1 to 5 started from the 1933. Uh, it was only only weighed five tons, or a bit over, as they started making f a few changes. Um, it was four meters long, two meters wide, 2.2 meters high. Uh, it had for its armor mill uh, armament. It had uh, the whopping anti uh, anti armor weapon of a 50 cal. Ah, uh, but wait. It was not what we think of as a 50 cal today. No. Because uh, 50, 50 cal Browning was definitely in use by this period. And that's when, when you think 50 cal or 12.7 millimeter, mm. um, we think of Browning, which is basically, the, you know, with the, car the whole cartridge is the size of a banana and is, is an impressive and terrifying round. The Vickers 50 cal was definitely half an inch wide, um, but was about two thirds the um, length of yes. the um, Browning... Um, mud use uh, 50 cal so it was not as impressive a weapon even as the uh um, that was the yeah. that was their anti-tank round for this tank and they also yeah. had a 762 uh, machine gun with it so a Vic, basically a vickers uh, machine gun uh, also installed in there for, mm. um, in a lot of ways this was more about the vickers company selling machine guns mm -hmm. and um, ammunition than it was actually about selling use, useful armored vehicles it was a useful armored vehicle mm. during the interwar <laughs> during the interwar period when mm. nobody else was uh, when nobody David was... Defletcher described it as no military use whatsoever but... yeah. as a police vehicle it was very effective for keeping the uh, colonials in check yeah but an armored um, truck would have sufficed for that but yeah mm. Yeah. Depends how uppity the, the, those damn colonials got. Mm. Um, okay, so later on, it did uh, get upgraded to a 15 millimeter uh, cannon uh, from the from the 50 cal, uh, which is it, not. A, I mean, that's going from 12.7 millimeters yeah. to 15 millimeters. That's not a it, huge upgrade. But it was a bigger round. It yeah. was a bigger round. It was. Um, uh, and for. Uh, it, uh, Armor wise, it only had uh, it had between four and fourteen millimeters of armor, so even less armor than the uh, six tonner, uh, and basically very thin uh, and not as very limited protection, even against um, uh, it would only protect against small arms fire. Now, anything decent sized uh, from a heavy machine gun would uh, you would be in trouble. Uh, however, both uh, I forgot to mention before that both the six ton and the Mark Six were designed to carry radios. So they would either be provided uh, if the Mark Sixes definitely all had radios. Whereas uh, the six ton is only they could carry were designed for them. Whether or not mm. they were installed, it was up to the countries of use. Which is really important to note that at least these tank designers, and um, obviously Carden and Lloyd as a, as a pair, knew a lot about what they were trying to do. But it's like, oh, of course you've got to have a radio. Mm. Um, whereas, the, you know, significant forces at the start of World War Two were still saying, oh, maybe we can, you know, open wave the hatch flag. and wave some flags. And find, um, and find a, a, a driver, uh, sorry, a motorcycle rider to, uh, dispatch rider to uh, take our orders from one, yeah. one platoon to uh, another. After I've had time to sit down and write the orders out. Uh, yeah, and the other and thing... they won't get lost and their motorbike won't... Yeah. Uh, um, Breakdown. The other thing with flag signalling is that, as as has been frequently discussed, by the time you button up your tank for combat, your chances of seeing that that the um, lead tank has even raised signal flags. Mm. Well, it uh, won't be the lead tank. It'll be the tank behind. It'll be the commander behind okay, you. Okay, the command tank. But, yeah. So, yeah, well, you're not going to see the commander behind you with his uh, <laughs> signal flags either, are you? <laughs> um, one of those classic things. Like, how did they think that would work? Um, but um, but. Because, Try they because, did because they work on ships. You know what was really because well, they work because they work on ships. Signal That's... flags don't work that well on ships, and you've got lookouts everywhere. Yeah, and exactly. uh... <laughs> the point being is they work on ships, therefore it should mm. work in, in, in the army. Yeah, um, it should be noted though um, that this was the dawn of the Horseman suspension system. Yes. Mm. The Horseman Coil Spring, spring suspen Suspension System. Which would carry through until Chieftain in the uh, 1970s. So um, people talk a lot about Christie, uh, and obviously torsion bars are, if you've got the interior volume for them, um, a really nifty way of um, doing suspension for a tank. But um, this is where Horseman got started, and uh, it would continue on for a very long time. Mm. Mm. Um, crew of three, again... So mm -hmm. driver, commander, and gunner. Uh, commander also loaded, worked as the loader and the, I think 
the gunner had to work as the radio operator. Mm. Um, they were still figuring it out yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was still important to say, hey, you know what? We're going to put two people in the turret. Yeah. Um, one person is too busy up here. Yep. Um, good speed. Uh, 56 k's an hour on road, 40 k's an hour off road, uh, 210 kilometer range. So it, it was something. Petrol could, engine though. Yeah. yeah but uh, the point being is it was, it was fast, zippy, and could cover some distance. Mm. Um, that had a lot of capabilities uh, that a lot of tanks did not have uh, mm. at the beginning of the war. Um, as I said before, 1,600 of them built. Uh, and, yeah, however, once the... Uh, and it was deployed. Let's see. UK mm. got most of them. Let's face that one. Uh, the colonies uh, did get some. So Canada, Australia, India. The Indian uh, uh, British Army in India, or whatever they were calling themselves at this time, uh, did get a number of them. Uh, and they do get their own version in Girls and Panzer. So I just wanted to... What's well, the most important thing? That is the yeah. moment. Well, I mean, somebody's, yeah. got to, somebody's got to... Re- so we've got the picture them. up right now of um, Australian uh, Mark is... 2A uh, Vickers Light Tanks um, in the, one of the Australian training areas. Yeah. Um, did They did take them to war, I think, with the 6th Division. Um, well. Yes. As one part of my reading is that mm. um, they were given to the Australians as part of their operations in Syria. So I'm, I'm assuming... That would be that, the 6th then. That were uh, they were carried out. They were part of the uh, uh, attacks that uh, had the Australians taking Damascus again. Mm. So for the second time. Mm. So again, one of those things that we'd like to harp on about because I keep saying that what's this tiny little country on the other side of the world doing, taking one of the oldest cities in existence mm. twice. Yeah, so for those who aren't aware, the Australian forces captured Damascus in both the second and first and second world wars. And it looks, uh, like, and it looks like they might have done it in the Second World War. With you know, I couldn't find any documentation saying they did, but they were deployed with the um, the Mark Sixes in Syria, and they did carry out the attacks uh, to take Damascus. It is worth noting, if you have a thoughtful disposition, um, that. Frankly, once you take a cynical view of Australian military history, you notice that every single time we ever do anything, it's about oil. Um, and this is highlighted by the fact our interventions in the Middle East in both world wars. But um, anywho, hopefully we I, can break we did, that habit. We did not mm. participate in the Anglo-Russian invasion of Iran. No, but we, it's because we were busy doing other yeah, things. I know, but, but uh, and that was directly related to oil. Yeah, well... The, <laughs> all right, which is where the Mark Sixes were operating. Mm-hmm. Um, so, where, where are my notes on that? Oh, no. Oh, no, that's all right. So they're mm-hmm. in somewhere. Um, so, yes, for those who don't know, um, uh, England and Russia can, uh, came together in order to... Uh, invade Iran in 1940 in order to uh, August of 1940 in order to secure um, railways from s- supply areas uh, no sorry it must have been 40 oh, hang on mm-hmm. you... well, I've got my notes somewhere in here that's alright we'll edit this out of the uh, podcast audio version so that's <laughs> something uh... <laughs> The um, video viewers get to enjoy watching Rob looking at his notes, which is mm-hmm. always exciting. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. All right. Um, Maybe let's move on. All right. Oh, man. But, 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 but. <laughs> okay. Um, but, okay. So that was uh, one. Okay. That was di- directly about a will. It was um, the Anglo-Russian uh, 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 Soviet uh, invasion of Iran to oust the Shah basically secure the um, secure the oil fields of uh, of Iran and the railway from um, f- to in order to be able to supply Russia with lend lease equipment uh, f- through the Caucasus and su- and making sure that uh, uh, the Russian oil f- fields in the Caucasus were protected from any subsequent um, invasion by Turkey slash uh, the, the the Nazis through that area so I was just basically shoring up their <clears throat> southern flank by invading a sovereign neutral country that had nothing to do with it and might have been leaning towards the Germans but had no had no alliances with them. Yeah, we just get back to the fundamental that for conflict in World War Two, um, it was okay for cavalry use for rushing around, getting around flanks, screening, um, but there were 
There weren't many better British vehicles, to be fair, but you, you could be sending troops out in universal carriers doing much the same thing for yeah. considerable less cost and difficulty. Now, and uh, carrying more useful payloads, too. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, well, speaking of uh, the beginning of the war, um, the British had, of the 1,200, they, 1600 they built, uh, at the beginning of the war, the they had 1,000 of these um, Mark 6s available and in use within uh, the British Army. And only... Oh, excuse me. Uh, and only... Um, 160, 150 of the cruiser and infantry tanks. So your Matilda 1s and um, your A-10s, I want to say, mm. um, cruisers. Uh, and so basically they this was the majority tank. That the, I mean, compared to a Matilda 1, this is a better vehicle as well. Yes. Um, yeah. But and it, frankly, it, the cruiser 10. Ugh. But, yeah. <laughs> but it was it was the majority tank. It was mm. They had 1,000 of these versus 150 mm. uh, of other things. They did leave quite a lot of them in uh, Dunkirk as well. But, uh, uh, well they, they were involved in the um, in, in def- defence of France in uh, 1940. Uh, mm. They were 400 on the continent. Um, however, you're right, only six made it out of, uh, out of France. <laughs> and then you wonder why they bothered. But... <laughs> Because they could not compete against the uh, pan- again, as the Polish found, they could not compete against the uh, Panzer II and the T thirty eight T's. Sorry, sorry, PZ thirty eight T's. PZ PZ yeah. PZ thirty eight T's. The the Czech tanks, which we will do the PZ thirty eight T, and when we get out, we, have, we guys, we've got a model making challenge um, planned, but I just need to move house before we start because I don't want to be moving house with a half built um, tank model. Um, that seems like a recipe for um, yeah, horror. That's um, going to get squished in something. Rather. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that's coming up. We're probably going to launch that in the new year. Then the PZ-38T is our candidate because it's such an important tank and people don't realise that it was essentially the tank that smashed France after they'd nicked it from the Czechs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Anyway, and the, the tank that it smashed was um, light tank Mark 6s, which, um, you know, we're sort of... It's, it's sort of you very much look at the, the all the the stupid British uh, light tanks of the interwar period, uh, not the interwar, the uh, Cold War period. Mm. Um, they look like well, this I, as well. Even even, <laughs> even the uh, even the early war period when they were just mm. trying to make up anything that they could in order to build up numbers yeah. and find one that worked. Yeah, but it, you know you, you, your your Saracens, your you know as we discovered up at the um, tank fest, sabers. You know, the sabers, um, uh, scimitars, um, you know, Spartans, a uh, four man APC which is another stupid yeah. idea. Um, but, you know, they, they, they all actually look very similar to, to this. And so it's a concept the British have hung on to, um, despite its uh, at times dubious value. But for cavalry, it, it does the cavalry role really well. Yeah. Mm. Um, all right. So from France, we then moved to North Africa, uh, mm-hmm. where the British were facing off against the Italians. And it actually served pretty well. Uh, in the initial stages of uh, the North African campaign, um, it was fast. It was mobile. It could cover great deals, a great deal of range, uh, and was able to outflank the Italian forces quite a number of times. Especially after they'd, uh, if they, once the Italians broke from any attack or counterattack, uh, and were uh, retreating or uh, withdrawing, um, sending a bunch of Mark sixes around the flank at uh, 50 k's an hour, or Sorry, forty k's an hour across uh, across the deserts of North Africa. They are able to then round up uh, yeah, against and, and scatter, inc- scattered scattered troops, and basically mm. that's why Australia had what twenty five thousand um, Italian prisoners mm. stationed here, or basically uh, uh, consigned here during the war, because we kept on they kept on getting rounded up in North Africa. Yeah, we still got buildings in here in Canberra that were part of um, interning all the Italians, and mm. uh, with all the um, the men folk of Australia off fighting the war, the um, Italian blokes on the farms. Um, Put their feet under the table quite yeah, quite well. They, but, uh, <laughs> there is a there is a, a nostalgic tradition of uh, of uh, within Australia of uh, looking fondly upon those times, and I'm assuming I'm hoping the uh, the Italian prisoners of war that were stationed that were consigned here to Australia probably uh, I hope that they uh, didn't mind their time here either. Uh, many of them stayed. Yeah. So um, That's yeah, <clears throat> particularly if the if the husband wasn't coming home from the war. <laughs> Yeah, um, okay. Um, All right, so while in North Africa there were 200 Mark 6s, but how, uh, by the stage they, they, the British had gotten up to 75 cruisers and 45 Matildas. Um, again, uh, they fared well against the Italian tankettes and light vehicles. However, when the M11 39s and the M1340s started turning up, uh, the 
like no, 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 no. Mark Sixes started having a lot more trouble, and, and when the Panzer threes turned up, they really had some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not> talking... <laughs> yes, yes. When the Africa Gore got got here, everyone said, "Oh, bugger, this is not going to be fun." Uh, and the the tank, uh, um, the Royal Tank Regiments, and the uh, the Desert Rats, and so forth, were very happy when they were supplied with the M3 Stuarts and were able to consign their Mark Sixes to uh, to history and say, yeah, we don't want to use that as a um, our scouting tank anymore. Thank you very much. Um, but they did still use them as mobile um, uh, observation posts and as anti-air anti uh, vehicles because they would mount uh, machine guns on external machine guns upon. Yeah, we have got a picture in this in the slideshow of a... Um, the, four, the four mounted. Yeah, four barrel. Um, vehicle which you know air defense theory thankfully isn't something we need to worry about too much in this podcast but it gets quite interesting in terms of you know you, you can spray a bunch of small light arms you're not actually going to shoot a plane down but if you can force the plane to fly a bit higher then it can't hit you with its bombs mm. so that's that becomes worthwhile um yeah and you know and then when you get to the point where you have gun laid radar with proximity fuses you can just Blat them all out of the sky. Mm. Um, um, they did. Uh, they were involved in the siege, of, the first siege of Tobruk, uh, mm -hmm. where they only had sixteen of them. But uh, by uh, because they were easily maintained and kept um, and kept mobile during uh, the siege, they were, the British were able to uh, move them around uh, the siege uh, the, around Tobruk in order to create the illusion to the Germ the besieging Germans that there were more tanks there than they thought there were. This is an interesting use case, and my first thought was, geez, that wouldn't be much help, but then it's like, hang on, if there's a breakthrough happening in your defences, and you can very quickly get a mobile pillbox with, um, a, you know, um, two big machine guns um, into that, mm -hmm. that, that can um, plug your line long enough to um, secure things. It really can, and uh, I mean... Uh, the, the strategy always was was uh, to let the tanks roll, th uh, the German tanks roll through the first lines of defence, and then have the infantry to pop up out of their uh, uh, where they've been hiding, and then ta and engage the um, the infantry at Tobruk, uh, while the anti tank guns and captured Italian uh, tanks and other bits and pieces would then take on the uh, Panzer threes that, that were trying to come then Panzer fours that were trying to come through. Um, mm. So, but yes, they did. Uh, they were deployed there. Um, the South Africans and the Canadians used them uh, more in Abyssinia and further south um, as part of the colonial uh, activities of so basically making um, ensuring the the Italians didn't go uh, didn't do anything more from around Ethiopia. Yeah, they, they were okay for beating up Italians yeah. um, and you no, know, the col I, I, colonial Italian troops, yeah. not not the. Uh, not the main, the Alpinis yeah. or anything like mm. that. But I, you know, I, I, I've often said in this podcast, it's a mistake to think of Italians as cowardly because of their World War II performance. It was more they just weren't actually all in with Mussolini and mm. um, were behaving quite sensibly based on the criteria in front of them. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, their armoured forces weren't great because they didn't have the heavy industry to build what they needed. All right. Uh, stay if they kept something like the Vickers Company going into war, then, you know, they'd, they'd have been in better shape. Yeah. Uh, they... Uh, in North Africa again in December 1940 at uh, a place called Bakbak. -Bak. Uh, I'm going to say how it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the third Hazars, King's, Royal King's Hazars, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. uh, they got bogged down and lost 15 um, Mark Sixes to versus the Italians in about 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. they, they could not have, they didn't always ha have a good day. No, when weird. the defenders are on their game, this is a very dangerous vehicle to be in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they were good at flanking marches. All right, mm -hmm. So. Um, um, uh, they also tried to send a bunch of Mark Sixes to Norway, but they got lost at sea when the Germans sank uh, the transport ship. Mm. So, um, other uses for them was in Malaya and Indonesia, or well, Dutch East Indies versus the Japanese. But even then, they they could not stand up against. Uh, well, it wasn't so much the Hargos, in because there wasn't a whole lot of tank on tank battles. This would have been a happy time for a Hargo against something like this. They'd be yeah, like, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah we're, the, we're the new breed here. Yeah. Um, you know, and then they, the Hargoes have to face things like Shermans and Matildas later and it goes very badly. But, but yeah. I, I, there wasn't a lot of uh, documentation of the, the two tanks actually meeting. You'd, you'd assume that the, um, the Mark Sixes were probably just um, you know, interacting with Japanese artillery and... Knee mortars would do these quite well. Well, just, yeah. just infantry, uh, without proper infantry support. Mm. Uh, if you're... If your infantry runs away because they've been uh, subjected to a Japanese advance and uh, you're not reversing fast enough, then uh, you get surrounded and you're probably going to surrender pretty quick. 
Mm. Um, they were deployed uh, prior to World War II uh, for a lot of, uh, as I was saying before, about pol colonial policing actions, especially in India. Um, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't have wanted that job because uh, driving... A bit hot. Well, mm. I'm just thinking about the, the humanitarian aspects of it too. Of, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a grim idea that, you know, desperate people trying to fight for their freedom, um, you know, get oppressed by um, some barely serviceable, um, otherwise piece of junk that's just beyond their capability to fight. Um, it's not, you know, thrilling. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, from North Africa, the Brits sent them to Greece and Crete and then Malta mm. as they retreated out of each of those areas. Didn't retreat from Malta. They didn't retreat from Malta. No, mm. so as I'm saying, that's why it was the last one I said. Oh, ah, right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. But um, um, uh, uh, August 41, there it is. I finally found the Australian, the Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran. There we August, go. August 41, not from, uh, 1941. Um, what else do we want to say about most numerous now I've done that look these tanks were not for serious conflict but they were for they were what it was uh, the governments were willing to pay for at the time and because they had um, low cost uh, easy easy to produce um, not a lot of uh, requ uh, manufacturing requirements it's thin steel uh, a small engine 88 horsepowers for um, both the, um, the Mark Four, the Mark Sixes, and the Six Tons. Uh, mm. That got upgraded by various countries as they got hold of them. Um, they were useful vehicles and incredibly useful as training vehicles for start for building tank cadres and all the logistical support. We, we mentioned that earlier about the Six Ton. Similarly with the light. It oh, served yeah, that sorry, role, and and it, it was even the Nazis used them for uh, training purposes, and to converted more of them into self-propelled guns after the ones they captured from Dunkirk, yeah. Dunkirk, and uh, and other places, and yeah. Crete and, uh, and Greece. Having said that, you know, if you were saying what is the vehicle we want to fight World War Two, this wouldn't be your choice. But some, you know, it's not that dissimilar in capability from say the American M two, um, and uh, you know. The, I mean, this was kind of why the, the um, M3 Grant Lee was um, viewed as awesome, even though it was such an objectively <laughs> terrible tank, was because it was an upgrade from this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, in its time, in its moment, in 1936, it was quite a nifty design, and it um, and then was still the only thing available later when things got a bit grim. Um, anyway... We've got a few more things to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to play a video now that we shot up at um, Oz Armour Fest. Um, Which inspired these. Yes. Um, I've got mine here. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, and um, so, Lottie, uh, thank you for the tip with the... Um, so, L Lottie, Lottie the Tank Whisperer um, is um, quite a character, and there aren't many women in tank world... Uh, and um, she you can drive. Well, there aren't shoot. many women. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> Fix break. Yeah, yeah. Um, she, she, uh, she's, she's quite the. Um, she's a very important figure at the uh, Australian Museum of Armour um, and Artillery, and um, um, we really appreciate the touch. Yeah, and also this. a really um, fantastic human being. And um, yes, so um, here's Lottie, and then we'll be back um, at the end of that to talk about tank biathlon, recent events in Ukraine. Uh, Tasman tells us the Kerch Bridge is on fire. Um, nice. Yes, but there's there's lots of other things happening in Ukraine, um, obviously, that, that we'll talk about. Uh, and the uh, new Abrams X, so that's all coming up um, after the uh, break. Folks, so it's Lottie Hassel die um, Hassel Hassel Grant. Hassel Grant, sorry, I've forgotten the last two minutes you've told me. That's right. <laughs> and she's one of the uh, well, wonderful tank maintainers and drivers and everything person here at the uh, Cairns uh, Armour and Artillery Museum. And uh, look, we've had such a wonderful weekend here, and we really appreciate the uh, time and effort you've uh, taken to speak with us, spend uh, and the work you've done with the tanks and driving us around in the uh, Sabre. That was great fun. We bounced around all over the place and really felt the difference in the uh, short wheelbase tracks versus the uh, Leopards and the uh, T-72. So look, could you tell us something a bit about what you do here besides everything? <laughs> everything is a good word for it. Um, generally, I'm one of the uh, apprentice mechanics here. So I look after 
pretty well everything that you see out there. If it runs, if it's got an engine in it, I've done work on it. I'm also one of the firearms instructors here. I look after all the firearms, teach people how to shoot. Um, that's the general coverage of what I do. Yeah. All right, and uh, look, we've seen you uh, guiding, driving, uh, maintaining, braking vehicles uh, over the last two days, and uh, we've really appreciated uh, seeing you out there and doing all the work you've done. I've got to say, the first thing I noticed when I saw you out there was uh, the goggles, and that was, that was one of the things I thought to myself, oh, I hope they sell those in the gift shop, because, but no, they don't, so uh, we're all going to go online and try and find your yeah. uh, eBay, uh, eBay, eBay, eBay uh, <laughs> split prism uh, uh, tangles. Um, look, I bet this, uh, I know this is a huge weekend for the uh, museum, and you would have done hundreds of hours of work trying to get everything ready. Good, hundreds of hours of work getting it up uh, up and running. Uh, how's it been for you for this uh, last couple of days? Oh, uh, it's been like a normal Osama fest. A lot of stress, a lot of anxiety in the lead up beforehand. You get breakdowns, you get all of that sort of jazz. Um, but it's been good. Yeah. Overall, positive. Everyone's happy. Everyone's really having a great time, which is the important thing. It is. It is. I think everybody has had a great time, even. Uh, even with a bit of rain today, everybody's uh, enjoying seeing the tanks yeah. go around in the mud. It's a bit of a different thing. To, uh... A bit of a washout compared to the last two days, <laughs> but hey, it's a bit of difference. It is a bit of a difference. Look, uh, and we understand that uh, you're going to be uh, doing some of your own stuff on YouTube soon. Is that true? Do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah, um, so I'm starting my channel. Technically, it's already out there. I've only got one video, but you can have a look at it if you like leopards or whatever. Um, it's Lottie the Tank Whisperer. Lottie the Tank, that's a good name. Lottie, yep. I like that one. Um, so yeah, I'm currently in the works of trying to get a few videos up, starting with a in-depth look at Centurion. So not just history and whatnot, actually getting into it, showing you the engine, um, how it all goes together, the important bits. So yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, share with the world about uh, the Kansas Museum or uh, your own role in it? Or? Um, come on down so we're in Cairns far north Queensland um, lovely staff here we all have a great time um, and every year we're running Ozama Fest every year every year so put it in your calendars for next year will do thank you very much Lottie I really appreciate the time you've taken for us today. not a problem bye and welcome back folks um, you can see we always inspired our uh, split prism goggles mm -hmm. Look at look how cool I look now. Hey, yeah. <laughs> now, just to uh, just to point out that um, I think Pete and Lottie, who were sporting those goggles at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum, didn't actually wear them for any sort of tank activities and wore normal uh, safety goggles uh, and just had those ones sitting on their hats like I was having before. So I think they're mostly there to keep the dust off if you are wearing them over the eyes. I realize, think but, they're yeah. mainly for show, just like mm. ours are. They're mm. cosmetic slash. Uh, costume yeah. style uh, things and I would not want to wear them on a motorbike uh, while riding around at stupid speeds or anything like that. Yeah, well, now, mean, Split Prism does give you some advantages in terms of... Um, I don't think uh, the plastic in the lenses yeah. is, is all that safe. Yeah. However, <laughs> what we've come back with is mm -hmm. another... Second beer review! Mm -hmm. Um, yes, because we did a second tank, apparently. We did two tanks, so uh, I thought, why not? Um, okay, so this is the Green King of Berry St. Edmunds IPA. So another British mm. IPA. It is crisp and refreshing and 500 millilitres, but only 3.6 alcohol, which is kind of perfect to round out the podcast. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sound, sound Beautiful good. head on this and lovely colour. Look at that. It's a green beer. Oh. Green can. Yeah. Green green um, spot with an E on the end, by the way. Green king. Yes. But they did actually make the cans green. Mm. Hmm. Mm. Mm. That's a very different flavour profile. $17.99 and mm. much easier to read, actually, you've got to mm -hmm. say on the, uh, my so poor, poor old eyes. Our signature IPA delivers the same refreshing hoppy taste today as our founders Green King created all those years ago. Um, $17.99, the brewery was mm. founded. Um, Green and King. Mm. Doesn't I mean this is a much more British style IPA. Um, Barry St Edmunds. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows? I do not know where that is. Sorry. No, if anybody not. does, uh, any of our English viewers do know where that is, please let us know. Because yeah, I've got no idea. Okay. Um, so just update from Tasman on the Kerch Bridge, which we'll get to in do Ukraine. Uh, hit by a missile. Apparently, oil tankers Ooh. are on fire. 
Um, the wow. bridge carrying trains have fallen into the ocean. This is sounding very exciting. Is thank, it the, thank you for the updates. The Kerch Bridge is the big one that joins Crimea back to Russia. Yeah, they cross the uh, CMM of um, CF. Azov. 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 Yep. CF. Yes. Um, right, yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay, any other thoughts on this beer other than... Yeah, yeah. Oh, you haven't even tasted it yet. Okay. I have, but... Much more British-style IPA, so it's more um, spicy than um, fruity. Yeah, no, I, I agree, mm. yeah. I was about to say, I didn't have, really have the words for how different it was, but um, mm-hmm. that is a good description of it. Yeah. Um... I like it actually. I'm not sure. It's um, mm-hmm. from between the two. I think the other one was much heavier t- on taste, uh, yeah. but more to my palate. Whereas this is uh, lighter on taste, but a uh, very distinct taste that I'm not mm. sure actually uh, is is my favourite. Look, I am. Um, no, that doesn't mean mm. I'm not going to drink it. It, it, it just my... means I may not <laughs> buy it again. Yeah, in my own brewing, I actually try and get a. a a straddle the line between the, the, the fruity hot flavours and the um, the more earthy spicy um, British ones mm. um, and um, this is very much moving the needle way over in that earthy spicy mm. um, category but right. um, so four pack of these from Plonk uh, mm-hmm. was $18 so there you go four pack so it's like four bucks fifty a can no hang on uh, maybe it was twenty eight dollars. Ah, okay, a bit yeah, different. No, it, it, mm. no, hang, no, it was, it was, mm. no, it was, uh, it was eighteen. Okay, that's yeah. well, that's, well, I mean, it is quite low alcohol, which uh, at least so there's not much excise on it. Um, True. Yep. Yeah. No, it was eighteen dollars. Mm. So because yeah. the other two were, yes. Look, as a session beer, yeah, you could knock that back. Um, no, maybe it was twenty dollars, but anyway, yeah. probably it okay. was much cheaper than. You could you could definitely knock it back for a while, so mm. that's good. Um, cool. Okay, let's now talk. About um, Ukraine. Yes. Mm-hmm. On the way to Svartava. Yes. Cool. So there we go. Um, so the the we've shared it on our social media. So if you have, don't already follow, totally tanked. Um, Facebook, Twitter. Um, there was a um, this engagement that's um, up on the screen was actually a Russian tank from there, the 155th Naval um, Infantry Brigade, which was also the unit that took Mariupol. So they seem to have their act together as opposed mm. to every other Russian unit in this conflict. I've been very disappointed by the Guards Tank Army, so I can tell you. <laughs> um, well, I'm mean, glad they haven't done well, but because I don't want Ukraine to be destroyed. But I, you know, just thought they were a better unit than they've turned out to be. Um, Anyway, so yes, um, it, you, you almost never see tanks fighting tanks at 50 metre range and it's a really interesting engagement because they're playing a little forward and backward dance to try and get and, their and, guns and onto each really other. It really shows the, uh, the difference in the engines where the, you have one tank that can do 4Ks an hour backwards and the other one can do 15. Yeah, when, you, when you're in that little forward backward dance, having the slow reverse gear really starts and to bite. And that's um, your, uh, um, so it's a Russian T-80 versus a Ukrainian T-64. Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, the T-64 came out very much second best in that one. Uh, we do have to remember with these things that real people are dying uh, in these things. So And we're just grateful um, it's not us, and yeah. we hope it's not going to be them anytime soon either. Yeah. Um, my mum... My mum likes to uh, find little bits of uh, newspaper paper oh, articles and okay. about tanks and cut them out for me. Okay. So just before we went up to uh, Cairns, uh, she cut one out about uh, Mephisto and uh, how it's uh, photographs of Mephisto from 1918 uh, and passed that one on to me. And I got to share that one with the chieftain uh, while we were sitting around the pub one night. He was very polite with your little scarecrow newspaper. I know, newspaper. I know. Yeah. It was just, it was just... <laughs> so mum's cut it out, another one for me to talk mm. about uh, the T-90M uh, that was captured in Ukraine and um, by by the Ukrainians. Uh, so this is the, the most advanced Russian tank, tank. In, unless you count the Armada, which is an Aurel tank. Yep. Um, yes. And, and how everybody's going to start looking at this and say, oh, what's it got inside of it? Hmm. So, I mean, the, the big thing with the T-90 series is it's a T-72 upgraded with Western technology, um, which is a problem for the Russians because they don't have access to that technology now. Um, but uh, maybe they'll find something that the Chinese can make them that'll, that'll work. <laughs> um, yeah, it was embarrassing for them to, to lose the T-90M um, in well, Ukraine. Well, have one captured. Yeah. Uh, whereas previous ones that have been 
disabled, they've mm. uh, taken out them and blown up themselves mm. in order to prevent that intelligence falling into Western hands. But uh, this one, yeah, has come out and... Uh, mm. We are, as we did the last episode, it was literally while the first breakout was happening around Kharkov and since the Ukrainians have been making uh, very successful advances. Mm. A few people who are quite clever have made the point, and I like it, um, it comes back to um, Clausewitz's um, thoughts on the culmination of assaults um, and that when you uh, your assault is culminating, which means you, you've reached the point where you can't go forward anymore, you're incredibly vulnerable to any counterattack. Even, even a yes, weak counterattack. You're, you're completely overstretched. Your units are depleted. Um, your troops are fatigued. Um, and... Um, this this one doesn't quite fall into that because the Ukrainians have sort of been you know spent quite a few months in, um, in a stalemate with the Russians before they counterattacked. Well, um, they, they did a great job of uh, some uh, sowing uh, false intelligence of saying we're going to attack here, so on, we're going to attack here, so on. Mm. Drew twenty five thousand uh, Russian troops from the from the Kharkiv area to mm -hmm. uh, to Kherson and yep. then uh, have gone through, uh, through around the Kharkiv area in uh, five days and, and are still going forward into uh, uh, into that uh, northern Luhansk area uh, while at the same time putting some... Uh, ma Kherson is still in a really ugly pocket for the Russians. They're oh, yeah. either going to lose the city or they're going to lose an army there. Yeah, it, but uh, the point is that they, they uh, by having... Uh, by Telegraphing their punch to Kherson, mm. they were able to sucker them in uh, in Kharkiv. Yeah. Uh, whereas the the Russians are still trying to um, the the Wagner group, the the mercenaries of the Wagner group are still trying to uh, bust through in the the Donbass area to absolutely no avail whatsoever. But uh, yeah, I mean it's it's worth really worth paying attention to what's happening in Russia at the moment. Um, the there have been an enormous number of Russian billionaires die this year. Oh yeah. Um, under I, under under mysterious accidents. Yeah, falling out of hospital window. Yes. Um, falling that, downstairs. Yeah, uh, and what we might well be think, seeing. Was it sixteen? It told? was twelve last time I looked, but there's All been right. a few more since. Yeah. Um, so, and that's a lot because these are people with access to extremely good health care. And, um, and lots and lots and lots of these are billionaires essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what we might actually be seeing is the start of a Russian civil war. Um, which is quite a horrendous thought in mm. uh, in 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 the modern era, uh, particularly with disruptions to energy supplies and the effects that's going to have on um, the rest of the world. Well, well these uh, these billionaires are all been part of the oil and gas uh, organisation. Well, that's, that's where Russian billionaires uh, yeah. come from generally. Yeah, but that's um, uh, basically they're the ones who. All, uh, so who knows what's happening? And the other thing that we haven't uh, talked about since the last podcast is uh, Putin has also called up in the partial mobilization of the Russian population, so... Yep. Now, now something that's been almost unreported in Western media is that um, from the time he made his first um, special military operation in Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. it's been six months, Yep. and 50,000 Russian regulars contract papers came up, and not one of them wanted to sign on <laughs> for, for to re-up. Um, so they're pulling up uh, at least... You know, your 22 to 30 year olds who've done their military service that are getting dragged back in are probably going to be quite useful soldiers. It's mm. not like um, the last days of the Third Reich when they were calling up um, children and very old men. Yeah, and um, grandfathers, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, um, to be losing uh, 50,000 fighting soldiers at this moment of a losing war um, because none of them want to... Uh, well, I'm not saying none. I'm sure one or two uh, well, They did, probably but, won't get an option to re-up. Uh, well, no, apparently they... they um, the, apparently 50,000 are walking off the job uh, <laughs> they, so. they probably won't get the option of walking off the job is my point is that they'll um, bring in new laws yeah. and say yes no you must uh, con continue and your uh, also as has been gleefully noted by western media there's traffic jams of young Russians fleeing the country uh, to, yes, uh, to get away from the mobilisation yeah. and, and it was uh, Putin's uh, 60th birthday uh, 60th? happy Se birthday 60th, 60th or 70th is it uh, must be 70. Really? Yeah, it must be 70. It doesn't look like a 70 year old. It looks more like a 60 year old, but he's been led a very active life. I feel as I approach 50, I really haven't you know, done <laughs> what, much. Haven't <laughs> overthrown <laughs> democracies, killed Ooh, enough people, yeah. uh, exploited uh, your, your, R you, the, the work of your country enough that to make you. Written my name in letters of fire a mile high. Well, that's yeah, what we're doing here, um, John. We, yeah. are, we are providing a something that the future generations can look yeah. back on and say. 
what were these idiots doing? Yeah, there's, there's, there's seven people watching this right now. Uh, <laughs> many more people do um, see and listen to well, us. Well, so I'm, just, I'm looking uh, at Dave Lister as my inspiration. As oh, you want work. to get abducted onto a mining ship? And, he wasn't uh, abducted. Yeah. But anyway, he has... He's, he doesn't he, know. He was so drunk he can't remember. Yeah. His name spans across the millennia. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> big takeaways in, in Russia, though. Mm. Uh, I mean... Sorry, you, you interrupted me at a moment there. Around Kharkiv, um, mm. the quality of the troops that the Ukrainians assaulted into after they'd dragged every, all their real troops down it, to Kherson um, was, um, we're literally talking um, tax police. Ooh. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, that sort of level of gendarmerie, um, para- paramilitary mm. units um, that, um, that ended up copying the, uh, the main assault because the Russians had gotten psyched out. And given that the Russians have this horrible split command um, where they've got um, independent generals in the... Um, yeah, there's no coordination. No in, the in the Kharkiv region and the, oh, um, the and, Kherson and, and region. And that was the whole point of uh, the operational security of not having one person in command. Yeah, well... Um, <laughs> that, how's that going for them? Anyway, the, the, the dude in the south somehow managed to convince the dude in the north to give him um, a, a ton of troops, and um, that has not gone very well at all, which will not foster better cooperation in the future. One of the things in the map we've got on the background, though, is that apparently there's a large insurgency um, kicking off in the um, area between Mariupol and um, Kherson, um, which is a further problem for the Russians, and... Given that the Russians started this stupid war for no good reason, stuff them, let them have problems. I want to talk about Elon Musk now, though. Yeah, yeah, Now, okay. Now, uh, I would say that Elon's proposal on Twitter this week um, was, was... He was high? Uh, well, I would say it was something he, that... Let's face it, he was high. Yeah, but four months ago... It depends, was, depends what on. But. Yeah, but four months ago, what he was proposing this week was what I was proposing four hmm. months ago. So it's like, yes, four months ago, this was um, a sensible um, settlement for Ukraine to make to get make this whole nightmare end. But having mortgaged their future um, to um, fight this war and having succeeded in uh, breaking the Russian lines and let's see how far they can go before the Russians can stabilise things, now is not the time to tell the Ukrainians they have to be moderate and reasonable. Yeah, no. You um, can't get... As, 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 maybe you should have told that to the Russians <laughs> in 2014, maybe not. Yeah, uh, so the, um, you know, as long as the Ukrainians don't start eating into Russian territory, and frankly, even if, you know... Well, sorry, wh- with the sham uh, um, referendum that was held um, within the four uh, supposed four areas of Ukraine that, have, yeah. that uh, Vlad has now annexed and said these are now these people have chosen to be Russian nobody believes that Vlad no is the point um, it does create a problem and this was why Vladimir went through this sham which is under the Russian constitution no one can cede Russian territory ever mm. so having legalistically in the Russian system um, redrawn the boundaries of Russia through the middle of Ukraine for territory they're not even in control of at this moment no um and with a sham. They, they then um, make it's impossible for um, any future Russian leader or even for Vladimir to give that away without going through the trouble of a constitutional amendment. And I can't see the Russian people particularly signing up enthusiastically to mm. um, give away territory any which way. That would be a very hard political sell. Now, um, one of the things we are seeing in Russia itself, though, is um, the people... From the anecdotes I'm getting from Western media reporting on it, is the people still aren't actually against the idea of the special operation. It's just that they don't want to get drafted, and that's why they're pushing back against the the government. Is they don't want to get drafted. It's not so much that they don't want to go to. They don't want um, uh, Ukraine to be uh, uh, taken over by Russia. Now, your thoughts on that? It, it, reading Russian public opinion for Westerners is really hard, um, and we. Re- I agree. That's why I don't think I don't I don't take that at face value. But yeah, we, we, we're really bad at it, and I mean, there's been you know just things like um, you know Western punk bands going to play gigs in Russia and being like, yeah, solidarity with Pussy Riot, and getting um, booed off the stage, <laughs> and um, you know, yeah, beer bottles thrown at them till they have to flee the stage. Um, you know, Russians have um, quite a unique. Um, perspective i was going to say weird but it's not weird it's entirely sensible for them there is a adam curtis um, documentary coming out in just the next few weeks about how the west um destroyed the russian 
economy and through what killed millions of Russians uh, in the 1990s. And it's something we're completely ignorant of. We're like, yay, why do the Russians hate us so much? And it's like, <laughs> no, we, we literally murdered th- at least three million Russians in the 1990s. Um, Without the bombs, but uh, it probably happened. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, it, it didn't need bombs. It was done with finance. Yeah. Um, it which doesn't, way, doesn't which make which you is, fit. Which is the way the West is killing themselves then as well. Well, yeah, that's uh, we've got a bunch of problems there. Um, Liz Truss is going to hmm. find out about that. Well, Liz Truss, Truss has Come. already learned a lot about that. Yeah. <laughs> in the last two weeks of yeah. uh, saying, yes, they're yeah. going to uh, uh, tax, tax uh, sorry, cut, provide tax cuts to the rich and then pay for it by uh, taking out loans from the bank. Mm. Uh, and also, you know, uh, cutting services to poor people. Oh, yeah, um, no, poor people don't count. Yeah. They don't. So yeah, they, uh, it's, they're going to let them starve and freeze over winter. Look, the UK events are really important because the geopolitics, the UK has been bankrolling uh, the Ukrainian war um, in a very significant way. And the uh, continued existence of the UK for the next six months is a little up in the air. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and look, the, the Russian oligarchs who own uh, most, of most, central, of London, yeah. most of central London uh, are really going to start being upset. Well, so basically Vlad will get upset on their behalf of if his property values go down, which is why they have to keep on providing uh, tax cuts to the uh, ultra rich and mm. the bank CEOs. I think I think they've actually oh, singled, they, they, singled, they got rid singled, of the caps on bonuses. Yeah, yeah. they got they, they singled out the bank CEOs to not get uh, to not be able to uh, be be able to make their billions of, uh, of mm. dollars and so forth. So yeah. Um, anyway, it's all complicated. And on that, we're going to move. I think from now on to the tank biathlon. Yeah. Which, um, it's, we're a little late on this because we just had we a really did. busy schedule for last uh, month. And um, But while we were up at um, Oz Armour Fest, we watched the, um, the, the the final round. It is it's, it's a shame the world can't come together a little more so we see some Western tanks competing. So in, for in those the who don't know, the tank biathlon is run by the Russians. Yep. Uh, and for any countries that would like to partake, and they get to run around in T seventy twos and do various activities. It doesn't have to be T seventy twos. It's just most of the countries are poor countries that can't afford to send. Well, they literally can't afford to send tanks, so they send a crew that uses the Russian T seventy two. But the the idea is that you're running around in the T seventy two. The Chinese did provide their own, but mm-hmm. uh, it has to be of a tank equivalent to a T seventy two, and they drive around a track. Uh, they w- swerve and weave. They go through uh, uh, ditches. They go through water fort- obstacles. Water obstacles. Mm-hmm. They fire off the main gun. They mm-hmm. fire off the um, um, the external gun. Uh, sorry, the crew operated gun. Mm. Uh, and they score points and do other activities. That looks mm. look. I tell you what, it looks like a huge amount of fun. Mm. Um, but it's a lot of national pride because there are how many countries? About twenty countries and all twenty countries compete. But I mean, you know, things like the Ethiopian team and the Iranian team. You know, they were just smashing into things and leaving the track at uh and, ben, and you venezuelans know, and venezuelans were not great well they were fantastic to watch but they, they did not perform well um and you know it, it, you just watch a lot of idiot cousins and nephews of ruling oligarchs who haven't bothered to do the training that would have been sensible to do before leaving the country uh so i, it's, bet, I bet harry would have uh, been able to drive those tanks better I don't know. I mean, yeah. He's, he's got he's got uh, experience. He's a competent bloke. Uh, I, was, I was more just thinking he doesn't have a lot of heavy armor experience, but he, yeah, he no, would have he, he would have done the training. So well, no, he, he drove light he drove light ones, but mm-hmm. uh, not not uh, heavy tanks. But uh, mm. he'd have a bit of use and command. So uh, anyway, they drive around. So teams of four uh, tanks go around this track and carry out various uh, challenges. And in the final, there was the Belarusians, the Uzbeks. The Chinese and the Russians, and mm. do we think the uh, somebody nobbled the Chinese there, John? Because they were driving their Type Nine. I want to say it was, it was a Type Ninety. Yeah, and, type uh, 90. The, the the Chinese did well. Uh, they finished second, but, um, but they did have an unfortunate uh, incident with one of their tanks, whereby they had to swap out one tank for another. Yeah, uh, it, it, was, it was a bit like behind. watching Formula One when you have a bad pit crew change. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That sort of thing. But um, the Chinese did well. It's quite funny watching it with the commentary. And it's a, a Russian person who speaks English. And it's exactly like watching a South African commentator um, when, the, when the Springboks are playing in, in the, the unbelievably biased... That's a very apt, biased, that's um, a, a very apt, um, apt uh, yeah. description. Ho, ho, ho. Superior Russian training means better performance. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, anyway, so it was, it, it was fun to get that in a small dose. Um, but uh, our point... We might, have, we might have been at the... Uh, uh, 
at Tank, uh, sorry, at um, the Armour Fest uh, for most of the day and had a few uh, quiet hails mm. before and after um, watch, yeah. watching these, these uh, the Tank Biathlon. Yeah. Look, if we, next time we go to Armour Fest with the biathlon song, we'll have to get a pub that we can um, convince to put it on. Oh, but, uh, I reckon we'll be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Okay, and now as we round this out, we have, it's very exciting, Rob, the Abrams X. Oh, here we go. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Look, look, look at the scroll effect. Hey. Look at the tanks. And what about what? What does this tank have in common with the uh, the Porsche Tiger One? I think it was. It's a diesel electric. It's a diesel electric. Mm. Now I, I did love a, a fight I had on the internet a couple of years ago. Um, someone said, "Oh well." you know, um, electric engines, maybe they, they aren't ready for prime time. And it's like, United States battleships were built with electric engines mm-hmm. in the 1920s. So I, I think electric engines um, are, are a moderately um, mature technology. But yes, so it's a um, it's a, a hybrid electric engine they're proposing. This is still a technology demonstrator. It's not a real tank, the Abrams X. Um, I, still, I did ask the question, when mm. are we going to go, uh, when they're going to accept the idea it's no longer an Abrams Abrams mm. M1, it is an Abrams M2 or something else. Yeah, I think they got, they, they got to come, mm. they're going to uh, separate themselves from the idea that this is just a new version of the M1. It is no longer an M1. It is a different tank. But you, you're seeing this in in the Air Force and the Navy, where various planes, uh, particularly the F-15 and the F-18, uh, are in versions now that fundamentally not the earlier vehicle particularly the, the Super Hornet and the um, F-15 EX a, a wildly different ve- um, from what they were 40 years ago yeah yeah um, but the, for, for the, the current mood in Congress is that they'll approve upgrades to existing platforms but they don't want to see a new type mm. um, so new types cost billions whereas Mm. Well, sorry, hundreds of billions, rather oh, trillions than, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, F thirty five. Looking at you, <laughs> um, yeah. Of which we did not get a flyover for the. Uh, oh, you know, talk about that enormous disappointment. Oh yeah, yes. The, so. the the worst traditions of the Royal Australian Air Force. So for the the the. the, the Service of National Memorial for the Passing of Queen Elizabeth II, our, Queen our, of our, Australia. Queen of Australia, our ruler. <laughs> um, sovereign, at least. Mm, but, yeah, yeah um, so for... The, She's on all our money. <laughs> the, I, I, I woke up that morning and I, I asked the um, the Google to tell me what was happening. and um, we, had it, a, we had a day off on that Thursday. Yeah. Um, because you couldn't have it on the Friday because the AFL Grand Final was happening that weekend. Yeah. And so you didn't want to cut into that, so you had no. to have the... Day of mourning for our uh, sovereign passing had, on the Thursday. It had more to do with the Prime Minister getting back from the service. It London, had more than, to do yeah, with anyway, the okay. AFL Grand Final on let me, the weekend. Let me, let me tell my story. Yeah. You've had a lot of talk in this episode. All right. <laughs> um, so, morning news from the ABC is suddenly saying there will be a six F-35 fly past at the end of the service at, I think it was 11 a.m., and six. You don't normally see a six fly past of anything in this country. Um, and F thirty fives is as the absolute newest thing. So um, I, Sheridan actually agreed to go and watch this thing. So we stood on Anzac Parade where they were going to fly down with um, a few thousand other people. Um, and um, eleven o'clock rolled around. Nothing happened. And it was just the comments in the in, 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 when you said and, and your brother was asking. So what's the bet? How many are going to turn up? Yeah, yeah. Because people were like, oh, the F thirty five. It's a piece of junk. They'll they'll, they'll 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 be missing a few. And and then it was like, um, yeah, none. That was how many the Air Force could fly. And their ex- miserable excuse was that um, there was a. Large, large store. There was a torrential downpour event at um, the, the base they were planning to fly them out of, but it's 2022 and they have access to weather forecasting. If they, and this is the classic thing with the Royal Australian Air Force, they are never committed to any mission. They And, and they are most of all committed to themselves and, and doing anything they're not very good at. Sorry, you have to keep quiet now. But uh, <laughs> And so instead of saying, oh, there's a huge storm coming in, we'll need to get those planes to another base to uh, fly down for the... Because it's not like we don't have a um, you know a, an a airfield. Large, a large country with lots of airfields. Or an airfield here in Canberra that they could have taken off from if need be. Um, yeah, no, instead they just cancelled the whole thing, um, you know, which is truly... The RAF's fitting uh, tribute to the monarch. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be bothered. See you later. Um, okay, back to the Abrams. Well, X. sorry, so the Australian Federation Guard 
were out in the rain mm. sending up their uh, 21. No, it was a 96... 96 gun salute. 96 um, gun the, salute. The, the day the Monarch passed, the uh, Federation Guard were lugging artillery pieces in also pissing rain yep. um, onto um, the, the forequarter Parliament House to... Uh, and they did their job. <laughs> um, yes. Okay, back to the Abrams X. Um, <laughs> the big thing is they're talking about eliminating the loader. They're talking about a um, slightly reduced turret size so that they can... Oh, and, and a much reduced weight size. Yeah, well, they're... they're they're there. So they're following the Russians' queue with Armata and moving all the crew into the body of the tank so it's an automated turret. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's a hybrid engine. And uh, having just taken possession of a hybrid in the last month, um, there are some things you learn when you're driving one, which is... You've got to uh, beep at birds when you come up to them on the road because they don't hear the car coming. Well, it's, it's not that quiet. <laughs> but, that you've got a fully electric vehicle. But things like when you're sitting in the vehicle and you know, you've know you got the manual and you're trying to change the settings to, to do what you want to do, um, when it's <laughs> depleted the battery um, to a certain point, it just starts the engine to mm. uh, top it up instead yeah. of having to worry about running your battery flat. Mm. Now, I am wondering how the uh, chieftain will feel about, uh, because he has a dislike against electric vehicles, as as he's shown in these t-shirts and as we discussed in the other week. Mm. Um, how do you feel about his beloved uh, Abrams going to a hybrid? Uh, but that'll be interesting what he thinks of it. Mm. And I look forward to seeing what he says. It is a technology development. And I, I, I was thinking about it, what's going to be the use of it? Uh, and uh, it really will be in that silent running, essentially, of moving through urban terrain, uh, where you won't hear a heavy diesel engine uh, or a heavy di diesel turbine coming down the street. Uh, and suddenly, <clears throat> whereas that's what you can hear now, if you're in some sort of a, a urban activity, uh, you won't hear that coming anymore. And so, whereas now you'll, uh, with this future uh, Abrams X, you'll turn around the corner and there'll be a possibly 60, 70 tonne tank that is rolled up with the bit of clanking of tracks, but without the mm. um, the turbo diesel going and l announcing its presence uh, around the city streets or uh, uh, any sort of um, uh, area that you don't have good lines of sight going. It's You get some interesting points of management, but to, to basically just to be able to sit and um, be quiet with the, um, the tank still mm. powered up is, is an important thing to be able to do. Uh, you kind of go back to, you know, World War II tanks could just um, sit and, um, you know, manually uh, traverse the gun with the, with the engine off. Um, and and we've, we've sort of lost that as more and more electrical systems mm. have come on. Um, well, and, and requiring a, a second power pack in order to be able to run at low, low power to be able to do those sort of things. Mm. Which a lot of tanks have, uh, are incorporating. Auxiliary these, power units, yeah. yeah. Uh, doing those days. Uh, mm. The other one is... Um, uh, with the weight reduction that they're looking for, as as I was saying, the 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 Abrams at the moment is a seventy three ton tank, um, and that causes a lot of challenges for on the logistics side of supporting and manoeuvring this vehicle, whether it's across bridges, flying at various places. If they're going to reduce that weight, um, that weight is obviously probably going to come off the um, armor of the vehicle. And they're going to be relying more upon active protections, whether it's um... yeah. But if if you, if, I mean, if you can reduce the volume of the tank, mm. you can reduce the weight of the armor and still give the same level of protection. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of compromises and quid pro quos in that, and and then you got to get some hard planning factors in, like what is the tank shipping weight they want? Because mm. uh, the C17's out of production, so. What's the next transport plane going to be able to fit in terms of volume um, and also in terms of weight? Um, and I imagine some very smart people are doing a lot of um, spreadsheet work trying mm. to figure that out at the moment. And yeah, well, and if you can decrease the uh, the actual size of it, uh, you'll be able to fit it into whatever container you're trying to um, move it around in, uh, as long but, but uh, well, well as well as the weight. Um, mm. But I do think they're probably going to. It, to my mind, the idea would be you go to less physical armour and more active protection of whatever um, that's more uh, reliable than saying, I hope um, my uh, whatever round is, uh, whatever anti tank uh, round is coming in, whether it's a missile or tank round or um, artillery or uh, aircraft launched is going to be able to protect physically versus I'm going to sh shoot off something that's going to intercept whatever's coming in so it blows up 30 metres away from me rather than on the side of my hull. 
uh, and that would be a way to save a lot of uh, armor weight in that regard and be saying okay what's the minimum we can take if if I can take out 80% of the 80% of the uh, uh, anti-tank uh, ordnance coming in at my vehicle at mm. 30 meters away rather than on mm. my uh, on, on my hull I mean everyone wants onions of protection mm. you know and, and multiple r- rings of it uh, but you do have a point that it's going to be reached though with active protection mm. where um, electronic warfare is going to become as important as it is in aerial warfare um, you know because um, if you can turn off the um, enemy's um, active protection system um, with a um, carefully timed radar burst um, then they're you know suddenly they're a sitting duck um, there's a lot of people going to have to make a lot of decisions they're not all going to get it right no. um, they're probably going to be better informed than we are though so you know you got to give them that um, I'd like to think so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think that the people making these decisions are uh, hoping yeah, um, are uh, yeah. better equipped than we are. So sometimes a lot of this stuff is just dumb luck. The difference between a great general and a general despised by history is often just you know the great general got really lucky. Um, it's it, it, it generals who win lots of battles. You got to say there's a bit more going on well, than one stroke of luck. <laughs> as Napoleon says, I don't need a competent generals or, uh, or I want lucky else. ones. I want yeah. Lucky ones. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. I think we're at the end here. Uh, Tasman has pointed out the French Nexter EMBT design um, has um, also come out this week. We haven't had time to have a look at that. Um, it's interesting with the German French that you know basically the the combined design is going so slowly that everyone else is staying to say, "Hey, use our design." Not right now. Um, saying, hey, "Here's one I've already prepared." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, Next has basically done that from the French side now. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I um, bet they uh, they whipped that up in the last uh, two months after uh, Ryan Metal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, hard to say on that front. Um, but on that note, uh, so do please give us reviews on whatever service you're listening to. Um, seven, seven stars. Yeah, as many stars as you can do and, and some kind words are good. Um, and um, join us on Patreon um, or um, buy a t-shirt um, on our Facebook and Twitter now have pinned um, posts saying where to find all these things. With our Patreon folks, we mm. are looking to do uh, some sort of catch-up once a quarter. And uh, yes, we'll we only have one uh, top tier uh, stamps. It'll just be us and stamps uh, unless more people sign oh, up look, for the top Dude, I'm, looking, top I'm tier. looking forward to catching up and uh, at a suitable time for all of us and yeah. having a brew and talking yeah. tanks because... Guys, we're happy to talk this stuff out. And yeah. uh, and look, as we said uh, before, we took the in, um, the invite to go over the British interwar tanks and we'll probably uh, review other people's suggestions as to what tanks we should do at mm-hmm. uh, later dates. But I do think we, we need to do a reasonably modern tank next one. Oh, but, yeah. we'll, we'll take, we'll take mm. suggestions and mm. then we'll make a choice from based upon that as to where mm. we go next. But uh, stay tuned. I'm sure we'll have something that somebody will like to talk about. And you're right. The um, the modelling challenge will come up in. Uh, yeah. new, let's say the new January. January yeah. we'll talk the modelling challenge. In fact, that's yeah. going to be a good one for me and the daughter to uh, yeah. work on over school holidays. Oh. Mm. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you 